In this video, we're going to talk about several things to be aware of when working on and restoring vintage electronics. All of this information is available in different places, in books, in magazines, and on the web. But I wish that it had been summarized in one place when I started working on this several years ago. At any rate, let's get started. The first thing to do is to inspect the equipment that you've got and that you're about to use or repair in a fair amount of detail using your different senses. You need to look for cracked or rotted wires. You need to look for the suitability of the power cord. You need to be aware of uneven or bad or broken solder joints, signs of past repairs that could suggest problems uh, that were repaired incorrectly or just bad repairs in general. I look for signs of water damage or rodent infestation. Uh, which happens much more often than you might want to think about. Uh, I look for burn marks and scorch marks, particularly on resistors or wires, uh, but even you know near tube sockets, um, you'll be surprised what you find. And then lastly, I look for signs of corrosion anywhere through the chassis. Uh, and in particular, I look for substances that look like they're coming out of electrolytic capacitors. In addition to using your eyes, you should also turn the knobs and push the buttons and make sure that those feel like they're functioning correctly. And then lastly, don't underestimate the importance of smell. You shouldn't do this aggressively because there are some dangerous substances that can be inside old electronics in particular that you don't want to inhale. But that said, if you just smell and you're aware of the odors that might be coming from the equipment, you might detect evidence of water damage or mold and even scorching or burning. You need to inspect the equipment using all your senses and importantly, you need to keep a record of what you find. Keeping a detailed list of things that need to be addressed or repaired or things that you suspect uh, may be wrong and that you need to return to in the future. You need to write those down. Another good thing that recording does is that it allows you to keep a running tally of parts that you might need to order. And it also forms a record for review uh, in the future. If something goes wrong, you can always go back to the records or the notes that you made. And sometimes that becomes really useful. After you make your list, you need to go through the circuit and assess the circuits. By assess the circuit, I mean try to understand what's going on electrically by starting at the power supply and following the connections as far through the equipment as is possible. This can be a fairly arduous thing to do on printed circuit boards. It's much easier with point-to-point -point wiring. What I'm suggesting that we do here is go through and do a sanity check. Do the filter capacitors have the right capacity of what you might expect? In a previous video here, we saw a meter had been recapped and the filter capacitor was completely inadequate. So that was a botched repair. And it's really important to be aware of those sorts of things. Do the vacuum tubes look right? Has someone just found a vacuum tube that happened to fit in the socket and put it in in order to claim that all the tubes were present? You should go through the equipment and look and see if things look and feel right based on your past experience. Capacitors before the 1970s, especially for the small values of capacitance, were wax paper capacitors. Those all have failed by now, and we'll demonstrate what I mean by that next. Here is an example of a paper wax capacitor. This one was made by Pyramid. This is probably 1940s or 1950s vintage wax paper capacitor. To feel it, it's quite sticky. This is the wax that, uh, that these were, were coated in. Uh, and you see that this is a 0.1 microfarad capacitor rated at 400 volts DC. Sometimes you see VDC, sometimes you see WV for working voltage DC. And interestingly, these are marked with the outside foil lead by a, uh, by a strip. This is not an electrolytic capacitor, however. This is a non-polarized capacitor. And so it's really tempting to just pick up your multimeter and test the capacitance of this by, you know, maybe unsoldering 
uh, one lead from the circuit and see what it reads. So this is supposed to read 0 0.1 microfarad. And you see here we have 0 0.126 microfarad or 126 nanofarad. Uh, and you think, well, okay, that's probably pretty close and this capacitor is fine. But in fact, this capacitor is very far from being fine. This capacitor actually will leak current and not hold a charge. And I'll demonstrate that next. This is a Heathkit model IT11 capacitor tester. So this consists of a capacitance bridge that allows you to measure the value of a capacitor, but it also consists of a leakage circuit as well. Let's just test this capacitor. And we'll start with the bridge just to demonstrate it, and we're going to set it to the 0.01 reading times the scale. And the way this works is you change this vernier, this dial, until the I opens up at its maximum value. This is the correct scale here. And you can see, maybe you can see, zoom this in just a little bit here. You can see that this reads just shy of 15 on that scale. Uh, but when you multiply it by 0 0.01, this measures just shy of 0 0.15 microfarad, which is pretty good for you know this old technology and I haven't really gone out of my way to calibrate this. But anyway, so that's, that's how you can measure the value of capacitance, which is not in question here. What is in question is the leakage. So the way that you test that is you move this out of bridge and down to the leakage arm. All right. And then you change the voltage reading uh, and see if the eye remains open. So we're going to do that here. So this is now at three volts and it's not leaking. Six volts, the eye closes, but then opens back up wide. At 10 volts, opens, it's fine. 15 volts, it closes and opens, but it opened much more slowly. So you can wonder if it's starting to break down. At 25 volts, it's just struggling to open up. It's still squinted. There we finally open. And then at 50 volts, you see the eye doesn't open at all. So this capacitor, which is rated at 400 volts DC, leaks at 50 volts DC. You can see where this would be really important in a tube circuit where you might have 100 volts, 200 volts, 300 volts, you know, several hundred volts DC across a capacitor. Uh, and if it leaks, then that capacitor is effectively acting like a resistor and not a capacitor. It's passing current, uh, and that's usually not desirable. So wax paper capacitors, no good. They have to be replaced. But what about electrolytic capacitors? So here's an example of a Sprague Atoms series electrolytic capacitor. Now you see that the band denotes the negative side of the electrolytic. Uh, and this doesn't appear to be leaking anything. There's nothing coming out of that side, and there's nothing coming out of that side. Uh, it appears to be intact. So the question is, well, what's the value of this? Is this a good capacitor? And the answer is almost certainly no. It is not a good capacitor uh, because the age of this, this came out of a piece of equipment that was made in the, 19, the early 1950s. It's almost certain that the electrolyte has dried up and will also leak. But we can test that now with the capacitor tester. So we're going to remove the wax paper capacitor and we're going to now test the electrolytic. Uh, first thing that we're going to do is take, put this back on bridge. Uh, and now we're going to hook this up. I'm going to turn that back to zero. All right, so uh, let's just see what this measures. We're going to put this on the times one scale uh, and we're going to adjust this now to see if we get uh, a value that's close to what the claim value is. And so that there is just above 50 microfarad. Uh, 
uh, which again isn't too bad for the claimed uh, 40 microfarad uh, on the there you can see it on the side of the capacitor. But does it leak? Well, let's see. Let's move this off of the bridge and down to the leakage uh, section. And now we're just going to start stepping up. First thing that I need to do is put it on electrolytic. Okay. And now we're going to start stepping up. See the eye is wide open. Looks good up to now. There's 25 volts, 50 volts. 50 volts, it's squinted shut and opened again. 100 volts, very slow, but it opens. 150 volts, it's squinted, and it doesn't look like it's going to open up very wide. So 200 will probably push it over the edge. 200, it doesn't open up past a squint. 250, the same. 300. So, you know, we're starting to see this, this leak at 400 volts and really kind of at 200, 250 range. So this capacitor is a leaky capacitor. It, it, it's fine at 100, 150 volts, but at 200 volts, it's starting to leak. And it leaks more at 250. So if you're using this as a filter capacitor, this capacitor has to go as well. And that's really true for almost all consumer grade uh, vintage electronics. But the bottom line here is test your capacitors because, well, you know, when they're 50 years old or more, they probably don't work. Having checked the capacitors, next thing that I like to do is go through and test the resistors. This was something that I didn't realize for a long time. When you buy books about restoring vintage radios or go to websites where this is discussed, either recapping receives a great deal of attention relative to checking drifted resistors or the resistors discussion is just left out. But for whatever reason, uh, I didn't realize it for quite a while. But old resistors will tend to drift out of specification. So let's demonstrate that next. So we'll just look at this resistor right here. So this is a, an orange, orange, orange resistor with no um, no fourth band at the end. So orange, orange, orange corresponds to 33K, and the lack of an end band means that it's 20% tolerance. That means that this resistor, when I measure it, should read anywhere between 26.7 and 39.6 kilo ohms. Well, does it? Well, no, it doesn't. It's far out of the tolerance, and this is a fairly wide tolerance resistor anyway at 20%. The upper value on that tolerance band would be just shy of 40K, and we see that this is just shy of 44K. So this resistor will not behave in the circuit in the way that the circuit needs it to or was designed. Just a, another example of, of this. Here is a resistor and the color code on this resistor is green brown green with the tolerance band being silver so what that means is that this should be a 5.1 mega ohm resistor uh, and the silver tolerance band means that it's a 10 percent tolerance so this resistor is fine if this reads within 10 percent either way of 5.1 mega ohms which works out to be anywhere between 4.1 5.9 and 5.16 mega ohms. So let's see what it reads. And this is out of tolerance. This is 5.8 mega ohms, uh, and that's above the 5.6 mega ohms. That is the upper tolerance limit. But just to make another point, resistors don't necessarily fail at the same rate. They don't drift at the same rate. Here is a resistor that I clipped out of the same instrument, and it was actually on the on just an opposite leg of the same circuit in this instrument. And we'll see if this also reads 5.8 mega ohms. So I'm going to clip this in here and read it. 5.8. 
And uh, you see that this resistor actually is in tolerance. This is 5.3, 5.4 mega ohms, which is lower than the 5.61 mega ohm upper band. So it would have been fine to have left this resistor in the circuit. This hasn't drifted out of tolerance. I clipped it out because in this particular application, it was nice to have resistors that were much closer in value. And so I just rummaged through my resistor collection until I found two matched resistors. But just want to make the point that not all carbon composition resistors that are old have drifted out of tolerance. You need to check that. The next thing I like to do is inspect the power circuits. Uh, and as I said a little bit earlier, that should start with the power line. So here's a power cord that came out of a 1950s vintage piece of equipment. Uh, and you can see that it's rubber rotted and that the power line is broken going into the outlet here. And that's extremely dangerous. It's not something you want. Uh, but the entire cord is, has actually lost its suppleness. So if you just bend this, you can see cracks forming. This is something that's very dangerous. Uh, so you have to replace that. On the theme of power cables, we talked about this in the video on isolation. Oftentimes people will have, at some point in the past, replaced the power cord with a polarized cord. But very frequently when they do that, they don't rewire the power circuitry so that the hot goes directly to an on-off switch. Uh, and that's, that's dangerous. So you need to check those issues as well. Another thing in the power circuits that you need to be aware of are the use in older equipment of selenium rectifiers. These generally haven't been used since the early 1960s but they do show up in some older equipment. If you don't know what a selenium rectifier looks like, here's a picture from Wikipedia of a selenium rectifier. You can see that it looks somewhat like a uh, stack of metallic postage stamps. Uh, sometimes they're circular like pancakes, but oftentimes, usually, they're square. Uh, and the dimensions here are about one inch by one inch. Why do I say you need to be aware of selenium rectifiers? Well, the answer is, is that they tend to fail. And when they fail, they will burn up. What happens is the internal resistance changes as the rectifier ages. It increases, and as it does that, it gets hotter and can eventually burn up and cause a fire. Selenium, when it burns, produces a very pungent odor, very pungent smoke, which in addition to being very distinctive, is also very toxic. So you really don't want to take a chance on that happening. They can be replaced with a modern rectifying diode. Oftentimes people replace these with 1N4007 rectifiers. And because the selenium rectifiers had a sizable internal resistance, you oftentimes need to include a diode in series with the rectifier when you replace it. I'll put some links in down below that discuss that, including uh, one very well-written article, but I just wanted to talk about it here uh, because these are out there and you really don't want to have to deal with a uh, selenium rectifier that has burnt and produced a lot of smoke. And the last thing on the power circuit topic that I wanted to discuss is the issue of safety capacitors. So many times in old radio circuits or old power supply circuits, there will be a capacitor between the legs of the power line or the power and chassis. And the problem with that is those capacitors, depending on where they appear in the circuit, there's always you know, line power across them uh, and there's a high probability or a high likelihood that those can eventually fail. And you don't want capacitors failing when they've got line voltage across them. Modern capacitors that are designed for this purpose are known as safety capacitors. There's two principal types, type X and type Y. I'll put some links in down below that talk about this in great depth and great detail. But suffice it to say that you don't want to replace an old capacitor that goes across the power lines or between the power line and chassis ground with just any old capacitor. They really need to be safety capacitors that are designed to fail in a way that won't be dangerous. Well, another thing is you need to go through and check 
the contacts on switches, whether these are rotary switches or on off switches, any sort of switch, uh, if it's old and particularly if it's been in a moist environment, can develop a layer of oxide uh, between the contacts that is undesirable. I like to use a small amount of isopropyl alcohol and a cotton swab if it's easy to get to. Uh, sometimes you can use solvents that come in spray cans and those are fine, but you need to be careful because sometimes when those dry, they can leave a conductive residue, which will have a very high but finite resistance. And so in some tube testers that have very exacting short tests, uh, if you've sprayed that solvent across switch leads and it's left a little bit of a film, then that can actually bugger up your shorts test. So in general, you just want to be very careful when using those sprays. Meters. Sometimes the meter movement in old meters can stick, and sometimes that's because the movement actually being damaged, and sometimes irreparably. But other times it'll just stick at a certain place in the motion of the meter. And when that happens, it's usually worthwhile being very careful and taking the meter assembly apart and looking for dust or metal fragments that have become lodged in the movement. One thing to watch out for, particularly in very old meters, the material that the magnet is made of will sometimes oxidize and grow whiskers that look like rust. And those whiskers, if they've come loose or parts of them have come loose, can fall down into the meter movement. So the way to deal with that is very carefully. I have had good luck in taking tweezers and some sticky cellophane tape and just going through very slowly and very carefully touching the tape to particles that have fallen down into the meter motion and removing them that way. This is not a fast process, but oftentimes you can rehabilitate the meter and recover it, and that's always a good thing, particularly for old meters that you have very little chance of replacing. And finally, sometimes you can come across toxic materials in old electronics. We discussed the dangers of burning selenium rectifiers just a moment ago, but a lot of old metallic chassis were coated with cadmium. In the intervening years, that cadmium has oxidized and produced what usually looks like a white or a grayish layer of dust or mold, but it's actually cadmium oxide. Cadmium oxide is toxic, so you want to be careful when cleaning that sort of equipment up. I haven't been able to find any guidelines on how to deal with that. So certainly if you come across this phenomenon, you need to be thoughtful and careful with how you deal with that. You don't want to aerosolize any of those particles and then breathe them in. There are some articles on the Antique Radio Forum that I will try to link in down below that describe this issue and how other people have dealt with it. But the bottom line here is you just need to be very mindful of materials that could be dangerous in the equipment that you've purchased. Well, I hope you found that useful. If there are comments on this, please leave them down below. Comments are always welcome. If you have things to add, please you know, join in. If you found this useful, please give it a big thumbs up below. And as always, thank you very much for watching.